This is Dan York, and I'm here at IETF 73 speaking with David Bryan, who is the chair of the Peer-to-Peer -peer SIP Working Group. Peer-to-Peer uh, -peer SIP, uh, tell us a little bit about what that's all about. Sure. So the basic idea behind Peer-to-Peer -peer SIP is taking SIP and using the same underlying communications mechanism, so a, a compatible way of doing a distributed communications environment. In other words, taking central servers, whether they're being used for locating other devices, routing the call, uh, or eventually doing things like services and, and voicemail and those type of things, and distributing a large portion, if not all of that, directly out to the edge uh, device, whether that's a phone or um, in some cases maybe uh, clusters of server type devices where you're pushing all that intelligence out uh, among those devices. Well, so why do you want to do this? Well, the primary reason is one of uh, efficiency in routing and also one that comes in, in in economic models that are somewhat different depending on where you're deploying it. So um, obviously, for example, one of the classic uses of this is a, a very small office type of a deployment where perhaps you don't want to have to manage, uh, provision, or, or store you know, in a machine closet that small box for a three-person, five-person, eight-person office. You'd rather put all that intelligence in the endpoints, uh, both for ease of management and for ease of, uh, of cost. Um, it's also being used in a lot of cases as a mechanism to distribute uh, large groups of SIP servers. So you might take a cluster of 10 or 20 SIP servers uh, and use peer-to-peer -peer between those devices um, to actually allow them to talk to one another. And, and again, there it's a cost-saving type of mechanism. You can distribute these around, get some reliability, some fault tolerance, uh, without having to use a very large database to back it up or without having having to buy dozens of machines, for example, um, you're instead at using the properties of peer-to-peer -peer in that clustering to give you your high reliability uh, and your information sharing that you might otherwise do in a more expensive way. Interesting. So you've got actual SIP servers who are talking to SIP clients, but then they themselves are creating a peer-to-peer Overlay. I know exactly. I mean, the first thing that always comes to mind when folks think about you know using peer-to-peer -peer SIP is either small office type deployment or, or something like Skype, where you're basically having endpoints distributed around the internet, all of which are actually being you know directly responsible for routing calls and doing that. But there's actually a lot of interest in using this as a, a clustering technology and internet connect technology, if you will, between the various server type devices as well. So you're really seeing this have a, a broad application. And again, we're not changing the SIP signaling. This is a way to do this sort of clustering uh, while still using regular conventional SIP for all of the signaling, which is, is obviously a key difference between it and, let's say, something like Skype or some of the other small office solutions that have been out peer-to-peer uh, -peer based in the past. So then if you're using standard SIP, you know, so what are you doing to enable the peer-to-peer? -peer? Is this an additional layer of signaling, essentially? Yeah, you can almost think of what we're doing as being a, a framework. It's a new protocol, and that protocol is spoken by all of the devices that want to collectively share the information, all the phones or all the servers that are being clustered together. And so uh, the name P2P SIP is almost a little bit misleading as a working group name because we're developing a new protocol. It's actually a binary protocol that's being used to tether these devices together um, and actually connect and, and build the fabric. So this protocol allows them to see each other, reach each other, and distribute information, um, as well as being able to split up and store all of the things that a server would normally store, routing information, registrations in the SIP case, uh, and again, ultimately, although we haven't gotten to that point today, um, other pieces of information that you might need, for example, for um, you know, voicemail or other types of, of data servers, uh, voice servers of any kind. So it's, it's really giving you the fabric to cluster, locate, and route without the box. And then on top of that, it's basically just straight set being used for the calls between these devices. But the uh, actual peer-to-peer -peer protocol is a binary protocol. That's interesting. That's Right. coming out of the IETF. Yeah, there was a lot of debate about this. Um, in the early days, obviously, the working group um, started using actual SIP messages. We looked at some lightweight ASCII-type protocols um, and eventually settled on a binary protocol, primarily because there's an interest in making this as lightweight as possible um, for devices that perhaps, you know, obviously people wouldn't really think about. Being able to use this, for example, to connect uh, very low power devices like moats or things like that, um, which you know you might not traditionally think about as, as using uh, ITF standards. Yeah, sorry, uh, moats are very very small uh, computer devices. For example, sensor networks might oh, okay. have these okay. very very tiny low power devices. 
Um, the lightweight protocol enables the messages to be very small um, and enables very low power devices to be able to do this. Um, also, less on the wire becomes very important for mobile handsets where every battery transmission is critical. You know, an obvious question around this is how do you make sure that's all safe and secure for no, but you know somebody else can't just join this peer-to-peer -peer environment. Yeah, obviously, you know, there's a lot of still ongoing work, but the the basic mechanism is that things are certificate signed, and so in order to be a member of this, uh, you know, you basically have to have a certificate. You have to be able to uh, sign and, and authenticate that the messages you have, um, you know, really are originating from you. Um, also gives you a way of encrypting information because obviously, let's say we did do voicemail, um, someone else, not my own device, might be storing my voicemail on my behalf. Um, the security is a very critical piece of peer-to-peer -peer because you're relying on any device that's in that cluster to store your information and help route your calls. So it's, it's even a bit more complicated than a traditional environment. Um, you really have to trust every other peer in there and that's why there's a fairly sophisticated model using certificates to ensure that all of the pieces are able to join in. And, and in a managed network, all of those certificates are going to be issued from a central authority so that you'll know all of these devices are permitted to participate, are permitted to help route the calls. Um, it's a very good question though. These security model is quite a bit different in a peer-to-peer -peer environment than in a traditional client server. Yeah, and, and you know I add that as a somewhat leading question. <laughs> being yes, Dan's involved. been heavily involved in some of the security work. And so, we certainly appreciate that. But hey, you know, I have to raise the question. So <laughs> the, the next question sort of is, is, so where is this going? Obviously there's work within the, the IETF, but you know, how long do you think it'll be until we start to see a protocol that's actually usable and, and who, who do you think will start uh, deploying it or using it? Or yeah, All good questions, especially you know with the IETF, there's always this, when are you guys actually going to be finished question. Well, yeah. um, I think for the initial protocol, so obviously the first piece of what we're putting together um, is really trying to come up with the basic framework, um, that protocol that we just defined. As with any IETF group, there's other work that we're looking at doing in the future. Um, but that main protocol is probably in the sort of 12-month, um, maybe a little bit longer before it'll really be at the, the full sort of um, RFC state. That said, it's already gotten to a point where it's, it's a bit more stable. There's a number of parties out implementing it. Largely experimental, although there are some commercial ones as well. Um, you asked a little bit about who's really going to be the, the customers for this, too. Um, it's actually, I sort of mentioned earlier, kind of a, a diverse group. There's a lot of interest in using it directly at the endpoints for the thing that's really intended. And, and those places are folks looking to do small office systems um, or folks looking to do like a Skype replacement kind of a thing, but one that's standards-based. So uh, in that case, you're going to be looking at carrier type, uh, or not carriers, but service providers who might want to be deploying, let's say, a soft phone solution, but do so without central equipment, on down to hardware vendors who maybe have a 50-person PBX or a 30-person PBX and really want to offer an economical but SIP compliant five or six person PBX where eventually because these are SIP devices they'll be able to sell you up to a, a larger one as your company grows. Um, the other folks who are really interested in this are actually on the service provider side where they're looking and saying you know really can we use this as a clustering technology anywhere from as I mentioned maybe clustering 20 really big core servers in their backbone uh, network together all the way to maybe every edge device at a small business uh, serving as one of these peer-to-peer -peer devices interconnected among each other and that essentially gives you a way to route between all of your customers in a very low cost, um, very efficient way. Even if they don't necessarily understand they're using P2P SIP, that device at their customer prem may be doing that instead hmm. of phoning all the way back home to a central box. So that's a lot of interest there. That's what I need. So uh, what's the next steps for the, the body? I mean, I guess really it's it's the, the P2P SIP working group, really it's getting the protocol out, I guess. And then yeah. Uh, right now the main focus and what we've really been doing is, is getting out the, the basic underlying protocol. It's sort of the first building block that we need to have in order to move forward. And again, that's where I think we're looking at probably 12, maybe a few more uh, months to really get that through the whole process and be out as an RFC. It's really sort of solidifying. Um, at the meeting here this week, we talked about it, and although there are still a number of open issues, um, it's a lot less contentious than it's been over the last few years. I think we're really emerging there. Um, next steps beyond that, there's some very interesting work that's coming out on uh, mechanisms for, for different types of routing. We've looked at certain types of 
peer-to-peer -peer routing that work very well, uh, for example, in the global internet space. But there's been some discussion of new routing techniques that are perhaps better suited to uh, closed environments where uh, there are no NATs, there are no, you know, some of these other nasties, if you will, that we need to deal with in an internet deployment. Um, and we're looking at a, a few other sort of things as well. There's some, some work that's just getting started on diagnostics so that you can use the peer-to-peer -peer network in a way that allows you to determine uh, which peers are behaving well, which peers are not. Uh, and also service discovery, I think, is going to be one cool. of the things moving forward. So, Great. So where can people learn more? There's a couple of places. Obviously, there's an IETF page uh, at IETF.org for every working group, and our working group is P2P SIP with no space. Um, also take a look at P2PSIP.org, uh, which is an open community site that I actually um, help to, to run that basically documents all the work that's being done, not only in the IETF, but also in the academic Great. Community. Well, thanks for the time, Dave. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And and, uh, you know, always good to talk a little bit about peer-to-peer -peer SIP and what we're doing. Sounds good. I've been talking with David Bryan, who is the chair of the P2P SIP Working Group within the IETF. Thanks a lot.